Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Indizor Education. Um, continue talking about Bernoulli statistics. Um, this lecture is part of the advanced mathematics course for um, high school students. Uh, it's presented on unizor.com and uh, this site actually contains uh, notes and uh, exams for registered students so you can basically um, take it uh, from there. Uh, it, it's actually better to, to watch it from this website because again of the notes each lecture is like a textbook basically so you can read it before or after the lecture. Okay, um, what I would like to do today is to very briefly summarize what we have learned about Bernoulli statistics and how to deal with this and I will criticize one particular aspect of the approach which we have taken and I will try to improve this particular aspect by introducing a concept of um, sample variation which we did not use uh, in the previous uh, lectures when I was explaining how to um, determine the margin of error and uh, uh, certainty level for your evaluation. All right, so very briefly um, reminding how it was done. So let's consider that you have a random variable C which is uh, distributed uh, according to Bernoulli distribution which means it's equal to 1 with a probability of P and 0 is probability of 1 minus P. Now you would like to uh, to know what this p actually is. We don't know it. And as an example, we used to say, for instance, we have a manufacturing facility and uh, it uh, manufactures certain parts and a uh, certain percentage of the parts is actually, well, defective, a uh, small one, hope hopefully. And uh, we would like to basically find out what's the uh, probability of having a um, defective part manufactured by this particular um, facility. For instance, we have two facilities and we would like to invest money in one of those, so we would like to know which one is better. So this probability of manufacturing defective facility actually makes sense to, to know to, to be able to invest money into proper company. So this P is unknown. So what do we do to find out this P? Well, we can't find it out exactly, but we can evaluate it. Now, the way to do it is we have actually made um, n experiments, got n results, zeros or ones. Now, what we know about this is that expectation of C is equal to P and variance uh, is equal to P times 1 minus P. I've done it many times before to derive these two, it's trivial actually. So. Now, when I have a certain number of uh, results of the experiment, uh, and each one of them is either 1 or, uh, or 0, now, what I also know is that the probability is actually defined as a limit of the frequency of occurrence of certain event, right? So, in theory, if we are doing certain number of experiments with this variable, and this certain number is very, very large, well, in particular, it tends to infinity, then the frequency of occurrence of this particular event should be closer and closer to this P, to this P. So it, the frequency is a very good estimate of the probability, as long as the number of experiments is large enough. Okay, so how to uh, find out, now, if my um, expectation is equal to um, to, to this probability. To find out this probability, let me make a sample uh, mean of this uh, of, the, of these experiments. I add them up and divide by n. Since these are either 1 or 0, 1 when the event occurs and 0 when event does not occur, so this actually is a frequency. Frequency of occurrence. All right, so this frequency of occurrence should, with n uh, going to infinity, should be closer and closer to p, and that's why m is very good evaluation of our unknown probability. Great. 
Now, nice. uh, our, our next problem is to basically to prove it. Now, how can I prove it? Well, we can prove it in a very simple way. Now, what is our value m? Well, consider um, the new random variable, which is this, where every xi ith is distributed exactly the same way as xi, and they are all, all independent, so independent and identically distributed as xi. Now, what is this? It's a new random variable, right? This one. Eta is a new random variable. But what's interesting about eta is that our mean, statistical mean, our sample mean, m, is actually a single value of this particular uh, variable. Now, what's interesting is, I would like to know, basically, um, the following. What's the difference between this eta and this xi? Well, here is interesting point. The mathematical expectation of eta is, well, one ends can be outside, and that's, that's a factor, and mathematical expectation of sum is sum of expectations, so it will be n of them, they're all the same, and they're all exactly the same as this. So this will be n times p divided by n, so it's p. Now, the variance of eta is, again, the factor can be taken out of the variance, but in square, because if you remember, variance is uh, 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 an expectation of square of deviation from the mean, right? So basically, it will be 1 over n square. And then the variance of sum is actually the sum of variances for independent variables. So it would be. Uh, the same variance as, 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 as c multiplied by n and divided by n squared. So it would be p1 minus p divided by n. That's very interesting because you see what's the difference between them? The expectation is exactly the same, but the variance is n times smaller of this. Now, what does it mean? Well, it means that if n is really large, our deviation from this mean would be really very, very small, right? Because the vari variation is small. And since variation is small, I, I should say variance, I'm sorry. Variance is small, then all the values, and this is one of the values of this particular random variable, right? Would be very close to the mean value. So they're all concentrated. Since variance is very small, then all the values of this particular random variables with a very high probability. I'm not talking about the 100% probability. Maybe there are some oddballs, but with a very high degree of probability, our single value m would be within this particular area, within, partic within the mean of, uh, of this particular uh, random variable, which is actually p. So m would be close to p, and using this variance, we can evaluate how close it is. So, it's very important, however, there is one unfortunate event. Well, we cannot measure this because we don't know the p, right? However, what we did before, and that's very important, I said that this is less than or equal to 1 over 4p, uh, 4n. Because the function p times 1 minus phi on this particular uh, segment from 1 to p has such a shape and the maximum is one-fourth when the p is one-half. That's a parabola, right? It's, it's a graph of parabola, y is equal to x times one minus x. At zero and at one, it's equal to zero, and it's directed uh, with this horns downwards, and the maximum is in the middle, which is one-half, and the value is one-quarter. So, although I do not know p, p times minus p, so I do not know exactly my variance of eta, I can always say that it's no greater than this, which is already good, right? Because n is going to infinity, right? n is increasing, so my variance is still getting smaller and smaller, and I can now quantify how small it is, right? Well, granted, it's not a very good variation. Well, with p close to one half, it is a good variation, but if p is very small and very uh, large, closer to one, 
then this evaluation is not really that good. But no matter it is, this it's, it's really evaluation from above, which means that if we will use this as a measure of closeness, we will get well well uh, we will get a better result, so to speak. I mean, it's more certain results. That's what that's the word. It's more certain results um, that uh, if we will use this instead of the variance. Um, uh, then it's more certain that uh, this particular value would be close to the mean uh, with a higher degree of certainty, higher degree of probability. So this is an assumption, and that's exactly an assumption which I'm going to criticize. I will try to make it better, let's put it this way. And then there was another assumption which I can't do anything about, quite frankly. Another assumption was that I cannot really very easily, based on the variance, evaluate how close the m uh, is to the mean value of, of, of eta um, based on distribution of, of eta, because this is a binomial distribution and it's not so easy to calculate, quite frankly. However, um, uh, there is a central limit theorem which says that with large uh, number of uh, added together random variables, the sum behaves like a normal distributed um, random variable. And the greater the number of uh, components, the closer distribution of this is to normal distribution with the same um, mean and the same variance. So, without going into exact um, discussion of how, how close distribution of this is to normal, I will just follow the, 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 the practice of just saying, OK, let's just use the normal app, the, the apparatus of the normal distribution to analyze this. Although, strictly speaking, it must be actually investigated as well. And, and that would affect the certainty level of our uh, conclusions. I'm not going into this. It's kind of outside of the scope of this, uh, of this course. So I will just assume that I can use the apparatus of the uh, random variables with normal distribution with this mean and this variance, or the variance actually is greater, uh, less than this one, uh, to analyze how close my any particular value is to the mean value of this particular uh, random variable. And to analyze this using the apparatus of the, of the normal random variable, I will use the rules of sigma. Now, you remember that if you have a normally distributed um, random variable and the uh, frequency uh, is uh, uh, graphed at, as, as a bell curve, right? This is my uh, mean. And now, sigma is actually square root from variance. So in this case, I can say that this is less than one half square root of n, right? Since I have this um, uh, estimate from above. So there is a rule of one single sigma. There is a rule of two sigma. And the rule of three sigma. So this is minus three sigma, and this is plus three sigma. This is minus 2 sigma, and this is plus 2 sigma. And finally, this is minus sigma and plus sigma. So, the rule of single sigma says that the probability of my variable, of my random value of this random variable, uh, to be within this um, segment, minus sigma and plus sigma from the, from the mean, is 0 0.68, I think 25. I don't remember exactly. I believe so. Now, in this area, the two sigma area, this one, has the probability 0 0.9545. And finally, the three sigma area, it's a very wide area and almost certainly uh, my values will fall into this area is 0 0.9973, if I'm not mistaken. So this is sigma, this is 2 sigma, and this is 3 sigma. 
So what I'm going to do is, although I don't know sigma exactly, I do know it's a variation from above. So if I will use this one, I will just increase my interval. Uh, and if I will use the same level of certainty, I'm uh, definitely in, 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 in the right. So I can say that the probability of um, absolute value of m minus e of eta to be without, uh, to be within level, let's say, 2 sigma. So the difference between these two values, the probability of this to be less than 2 sigma is um, greater than 0 0.9545, right? It would be equal if it would be real 2 sigma, but since my sigma is actually greater, then the probability would be greater because I'm expanding. Now, so I can quantify everything except this is really not such a good approximation in case my p is closer to 0 or closer to 1. Now let's try to um, in, uh, make, make it a little better. So my purpose for today, now this, whatever I was just saying before, it's kind of a repetition of whatever was before. And now I'm going to suggest you the way to improve this particular um, uh, expression for variance of eta um, to make it smaller actually, to make it closer to the real um, variance. Especially it's important for uh, smaller uh, p or larger, gr gr uh, closer to 1 p. Because in this particular case, the variation which I have made, which is a true variation for p from 0 to 1, uh, it's not really a very good one. For smaller p, well, let's just take a look at this. For instance, p is equal to 0 0.01. Now, what is this? This one is 0 0.01 times 0 0.99, so let's say it's 0, 0, what's a 0, 0.99, something like this, right? Um, yeah, I think I'm right. Now, what is this? This is 0 0.25. You see the difference? This is obviously greater, but it's so much greater that it screws up basically the validity of our uh, uh, of our variation. I mean, we can evaluate much more precisely if, if we knew that this is, you know, in this particular uh, in this particular range. So the difference is huge. The difference is 25 times. I have increased my um, uh, variance uh, by the factor of 25. That's just too much, right? So let's try to improve it. Now, the way we improve it is the following. Now, you remember that And what did we do to evaluate P, or evaluate basically, which is the same thing, uh, the mean value of C? We used arithmetic average of the sample, right? Sample mean. That's what we were using. Can we use something like this to evaluate this? Well, basically, absolutely. Let's consider what we did. To evaluate the mean, we took the values and took arithmetic average of this. Now, what is this? This is average deviation, square deviation from the mean, right? You remember what the, what's the definition of variance? It's a mathematical expectation of deviation of our uh, random variable from its mean square. That's what it is. So we are averaging deviation from average square. Okay, great. Now, we don't know, obviously, the random variables. We know just our sample. But let's use the sample to do this. We have already evaluated this, this, with this, right? And we basically replace this with particular value. So let's just use particular value, x1 minus m squared plus etc. plus xn minus m squared 
and if, uh, divide it by n, make an average of it, and we can call it s square n, and we can call it an approximation of the variance. Seems to be reasonable, right? So instead of just um, saying that this is less than one quarter, I use my sampling to basically um, evaluate more precisely the variance of C. It seems to be making sense. Now, what should we actually do to prove that this makes sense? And what's good and what's bad about it? Well, first of all, let me talk about what's bad about evaluation of variance, using this as evaluation of va va variance. Well, bad is, it's not precise. It's evaluation, which means it introduces a, cer a certain level of uncertainty. You see how many uncertainties we have introduced? We have introduced before that our um, binomially distributed um, random variable eta we have assumed it's distributed almost like a normally distributed. That we don't know how much, how close this distribution of this binomial um, variable is to the normal variable, but we have introduced basically some element of uncertainty and we did not quantify it. Well, which is bad in some way, but uh, again, the quantification of this is kind of difficult. It goes outside of the scope. And we, well, we took it for granted that it's not such a great um, disturbance in our certainty level. Now, here we are introducing one more uncertainty. We are replacing something not with the upper bound as we did before, which did not introduce any uncertainty. It just make our, made our evaluation uh, much, less, uh, much, much less narrow. Not, not as narrow as we could, probably. Now, we have um, uh, substituted this instead of variance, and this is evaluation, which means it's not precise. It may be greater, may be smaller. And that's the problem. It introduced certain level of uncertainty which is difficult to quantify. Difficult but not completely impossible. There are two very important aspects of approximation of this as an approximation of this. Well, uh, there are two very important factors. The factor number one, a variation of something should actually be unbiased. Now, in what way I mean unbiased? Actually, we did discuss this before. Now, what is this? This is a single value of eta, right? Now, what's the mean value of eta? Because we know that values are somewhere around mean value, right? And that how close is basically this, um, described by, by the variance. But we would like this mean value to be exactly what our evaluation is supposed to be. That's what, we are, that's what we're trying to evaluate. Mean value of this is, as we were talking before, is exactly this. So, mean value of eta is p. And variance of eta, as you remember, is uh, p times 1 minus p divided by n. Now, now we are trying, so, this value, this value has the same expectation as this and as this. So basically, a single value of a random variable eta um, is a, a good approximation in the, in, in, in the sense that the mean value of this, around which our single value is distributed, is exactly the same as what we are trying to evaluate. Now, what is this? Well, this is a different variable. Let's call it zeta. That's not a nice zeta. This is zeta. And how can I express this? Well, this is a single value of a variable, of a random variable, equals to 1 over n. And here I will have C1 minus, instead of m, we put C1 plus, etc., Cn divided by n squared plus 
etc. And the last one would be xi n minus this sum. Okay, this random variable, which is expressed in terms of xi, actually is the random variable of which this is a single value, right? Because m is this, and this is a single value of this, and x is a single value of this. And where, where xi1, xi n, uh, uh, of course, are identically distributed and independent variables with the same probabilities p and y minus p. So, it would be great if mathematical expectation of this is this variance. If I can prove this, then at least I will say that this is an unbiased evaluation of my variance. Okay, so being unbiased is very good. The second is how close these values are to this. Now, to do this, I have to evaluate the variance of this. So my expectation of um, zeta should be um, equal to this, and my uh, variance of, eta, of, of zeta should be very, very small as n is in increases to infinity, right? Well, let's just try to check it. So the rest of this lecture, I would like to prove that uh, the mathematical expectation of zeta is this. Well, actually, that's not exactly what I'm going to prove. I'm going to prove that it's not exactly this, but I will correct it in a way that it will be. Let's put it this way. So I will have to correct this particular uh, random variable, and that's why I would correct this thing in a very small way, very um, uh, small touch to, to this formula to make this uh, exactly expectation of this to be exactly equal to my variance. All right, so let's examine what this is. Okay. So we need expectation of zeta. Now. First of all, 1n should go out, that's the factor. Now here I have n components added together, and mathematical expectation of sum is a sum of mathematical expectations, right? And mathematical expectation of each one of them is exactly the same, because these xi1, xi n, and these are all identically distributed and independent. So I will have n uh, expectations of this of this thing and expectation of so let me just take the first one of them because they're all the same so I will put c1 minus c1 plus etc plus c n and square expectation of this and obviously this goes out and that's what I have Now, how can I evaluate this expectation? Well, let's just raise this into a square, like, you know, a square, sorry, a, a minus b square is equal to a square minus 2ab plus b square, right? Now, this is my a and this is my b. So, what will be is the following. Equals expectation of c1 square right square of this minus 2 expectation I took factor 2 out of c1 times c1 plus plus cn divided by n plus expectation of C1 plus etc plus Cn divided by, no, not by 2, divided by n 
square right equals now what's the expectation of c1 square well c1 is equal to c1 square uh, is equal to 1 or 0 right because c1 is equal to 1 or 0 so c1 and c1 square are actually the same thing and that's that, that's why expectation is exactly equal to p so it's one with a probability of p one square or one and zero is probability of one minus p so we have one uh, so we have p that's easy <coughs> now this all right let's just think about this if i will multiply it well let's just put it this way C1 C1 plus C1 C2 plus etc plus C1 Cn divided by n, right? That's what we have. And I will repeat this as is. Square divided by n square. That's a little easy, right? square here and here, I put it separate, equals, okay, my p is here, now minus 2, now what is this, well n obviously can go out, so it's 2 divided by n, now expectation of sum is sum of expectation, so this one is c1 square, and we know the expectation of this, right, it's p, now all these are expectation of the multiple uh, of uh, product of two uh, independent uh, random variables, and expectation of two independent variables is product of their uh, of the of their expectation. Now product of uh, expectation of c1 times product uh, t times uh, uh, expectation of c2. So it's p and p, right? Because expectation of each one of them is p. So it's p square, and how many times p square is? n minus 1 time, right? That's what it is. And now, how about this one? Well, obviously, 1 over n squared can go out. What's inside? All right, here is how we can do it. Think about what is x1 plus etc. plus xn squared. Well, that's x1 plus xn times c1 plus etc plus uh, xn. Now, we have n components here and n components there. So they're all multiplied to each other. How many components will be as a result? Well, n square, obviously, right? Because with each of the first sum will be one of the, any one of those uh, components of the second sum, second uh, component of this product. So we have n square different expressions. Some of them are squares, like c1 times c1 would be c1 squares, or c2 times c2 will be square. How many squares would be n of them, right? And the expectation of each one of them, like expectation of c1 or c2 square or c2 square, etc., is p. So it would be n times p. Now, the rest, n square minus n components, would be equal to expectation of, let's say, xc1 times xc2, or xc7 times xc17. Now, expectation of product is product of expectation for independent variables, so it's p and p, so it's p squared. That's it. Now, all we have to do is to do some um, algebraic manipulation which uh, I have done in the notes for this lecture I'll just give you the result it's a little disappointing right this is disappointing you remember we are evaluating variance of C variance of C is this now as n is increasing to infinity, this thing becomes greater, uh, actual greater and greater, uh, approaching one. But for a smaller n, it's not one. It's like 99 hundredths or 999 of a uh, thousands, etc. So it's not one. 
So this is not exactly equal to p times 1 minus p, which means our evaluation, whatever we were talking about, uh, uh, the sample variance, as we called it, uh, is not really an unbiased evaluation. So let me write it again here. Our evaluation was called Sn square, which is 1 over n, sum of xi minus m square, i from 1 to n. Average of uh, deviation from the mean square. And this is also the sample mean, obviously. So this is not our unbiased evaluation. Can we do it better than that? Well, there is a very simple uh, solution. Let's consider Sn minus 1 squared, which is 1 over n minus 1 sigma xi minus m squared i 1 to n. What's the difference between them? Well, the difference is factor. So if I will multiply s n square by this factor, I will get n, uh, s n minus 1, because the sum is exactly the same. It's all n parameters, but I divide by n minus 1 instead of n. Now, if I will multiply this by factor, now obviously all my calculations uh, will be basically the same, except this factor will go out in from the very beginning, and multiply by this factor my uh, real expectation of uh, 1 over n minus 1 sigma xi minus expectation of xi square. Right? This would be exactly p times 1 minus p. Because now, and this sum is again, it's all n components from 1 to n, but, divi but division is by, by n minus 1. So by dividing by n minus 1 instead of n, here, here, this, we make our evaluation unbiased. Because considering this to be a single value of this variable, we get exactly the same expectation as the value which we would like to evaluate, the variance of xi. Okay, so, what's the bottom line of, of whatever I, I was just discussing so far? Yes, we can more precisely evaluate our um, variance. So instead of making a root evaluation, I call it root, we can make more precise evaluation using this. Don't forget this n minus 1. Division of sum of n, but divided by n minus 1. So it's not exactly arithmetic average, according to a classical definition of arithmetic average. So using this, we will get an unbiased <coughs> evaluation of, of this thing. Is it good or bad as evaluation? Well, that's actually a big question, because I know that expectation of this is exactly this. But I don't know the variance of this. Now, to calculate the variance is possible, but again, it's too complicated for this particular course, and I'm not going to do it. However, I will definitely tell you that the variance of this variable uh, goes down to zero as n goes to infinity. So if you will calculate the, vari the variance of this, it's uh, n in the, in the denominator, all right? So, which means that we can definitely improve our um, uh, evaluation of the variance by using this. And with a relatively large number, n, the variance of this relative to its average value, to its um, mean expectation value, is really very, very small. And we will have the right to do it. Let's put it this way. So we have now unbiased evaluation. Instead of evaluation from the top, we have an unbiased evaluation of the exact value. 
However, it's not with 100% certainty. It has certain degree of uncertainty, which is introduced into the whole, uh, by, uh, whole system of equations. And that's what basically makes this, um, well, let's put it this way, more precise but less certain. Uh, and, you know, uh, different people prefer different things, let's put it this way. But this is definitely a valid approach if your n is significantly large, which means that the variance of this around its um, mean value is not really the big one. Well, that's it for today. I do suggest you to read my notes for this lecture. It has a little bit more maybe elaborate uh, calculations for those who would like to, to follow it. And uh, it will probably give you yet another um, view and another uh, step in your conquering of this particular thing. Anyway, I would like you to remember that whatever we did um, uh, was actually in pursuit of certain evaluation and this, evalu this evaluation must be number one unbiased and number two um, the corresponding random variables of which our evaluation is just a value should have a small variance that's what's important so all the values including our sample value are relatively close to the mean value and the fact that the mean value is exactly what we are trying to evaluate has been already established. So the mean value of our new random variable, like this one, is exactly what we need. In this case, it's a variance. But the variance of this should be small enough, which means our sample should be big enough. And um, in the next lecture, I will consider the same problems I did before, but before I did with this evaluation of my variance. Now, in the next lecture, I will explain what if I will replace with this evaluation of my variance, how significantly it will change the calculations of, let's say, certain number of um, uh, experiments to achieve certain certainty and certain margin of error. That would be the next. For today, that's it. Thank you very much and good luck.